Because this was the golden age of propaganda. When propaganda was concentrated into the sights and sounds of films. Propaganda that took months and sometimes years to plan and produce. Propaganda so well crafted and compelling that it was profitable. The target audience paid for the luxury of being programmed and then left the theaters wanting more. And it was during this golden age of propaganda that the propagandists produced the best results. With complete control of the national narrative on both the large and small screens in America, the subtle whispers coming from Hollywood got louder and louder and more extreme, desensitizing its audience. Lately, we've seen a wave of anti-white hate. And while it might be reaching a fever pitch now, this is something that has been cultivated slowly and carefully for longer than many of us have even been alive. I was curious as to when exactly this message really began to be mainstream, the first real overt attacks on the white Christian majority. So I began by looking back at films that had been nominated or had won Oscars, as this would demonstrate that the film wasn't some kind of fringe creation, but that it represented the mainstream messaging being put out by Hollywood. And while I found several examples going back much further than I expected, including the 1952 film High Noon that John Wayne called out as being the product of anti-American communist writers, and there were certainly whispers belittling white Christian males and depicting them as weak and cowardly, but, but these whispers, 27 years later, as the baby boomers begin to come of age and start having families, these whispers had evolved into shouts by 1979 in the film Norma Ray. I think it's important to get to know the kind of messaging that the baby boomers were subjected to that led to some of the problems and discrimination we face today. Now there are certainly other movies that have the same anti-white, anti-American themes that Norma Ray does. I feel as if none quite encapsulate the absolute contempt the filmmakers had for European Americans, their culture, their religion, and even their system of government. In fact, it's so on the nose, it's kind of ridiculous. When you watch it today, it's, it's extremely transparent. Norma Ray was written by Jewish writers Irving Ravitch and Harriet Frank. And I mentioned they were Jewish because in many ways, this film is about Jewish identity coming into contact with white identity and then attempting to change it because it sees white identity as inferior. So it's important to understand that this movie was written by Jewish writers and directed by a Jewish director, co-starring a Jewish actor, and that this is the lens that they looked at white America through. This is so important because if you understand that aspect and you understand that this movie was awarded two Oscars and nominated for two others, including Best Picture and, and even nominated for the highest prize at the Cannes Film Festival... So this view, given the demographics in Hollywood, arguably represents the Jewish view of white America in 1979, which I think is important to understand. And it's one of the things I like about older movies, because it's kind of like a time capsule. Now, the movie begins at a textile factory somewhere in the South. We are introduced to the film's namesake, Norma Ray, who is a hardworking single mother, but who, along with, uh, well, quite frankly, every other white person in the entire movie is uneducated, ignorant, and uh, racist. In fact, they make this extremely clear right off the bat when the, uh, the film's hero, a left-wing Jewish labor organizer who comes uninvited from New York to try to unionize the textile mill where the majority of the townspeople work, thus saving them from the evil white factory owners, but moreover, their ignorant hillbilly selves. And wouldn't you know it, that ignorance rears its ugly face the moment he rolls into town and he tries to rent a room from Norma Ray's father. And her father finds out he's Jewish. As far as I'm concerned, all of you people are communists or agitators or crooks or Jews or all four rolled together. Reuben tells Norma's father that he's stupid for letting the factory rip him off and calls him a shlemiel. Today's inflation, that makes you a bit of a shlemiel. And Norma's father chases him off and he goes off and rents a room at the local hotel. The same hotel where we find out that the hardworking single mom Norma is having an affair with some other ignorant white trash person who in keeping with his white trash persona, decides to start beating her. Uh, she leaves and encounters Reuben on her way out, and he gives her some ice for her face, and the two start to get to know each other. Uh, the first thing the writers do is draw a stark contrast 
between Norma, the simple white woman with the limited vocabulary who seems stunned that Reuben has books. The implication, of course, is that Norma doesn't read much or if she even knows how to read at all. And between Reuben's Jewish girlfriend back home in New York, who we, we never meet, but who's named Dorothy Finkelstein and who is described as a Harvard graduate lawyer. Then we go back to Norma's ignorance and bigotry when she says, after asking Reuben if he's a Jew, she says, and, and it's not supposed to be a joke, she says she thought Jews had horns on their head. I heard you all had horns. Oh. Oh, circumcised, yes, horns, no. This scene is the first scene with the two main characters meeting and establishing a relationship and, and setting a tone for the rest of the film. And it's through this lens that the writers and the director view white America. And to make extra sure that the audience understands that the white people are viewed as different. When Norma says, now after meeting a Jew for the first time, that he doesn't seem that different than, than she is, he says this. As far as I can see, you don't look any different from the rest of us. Oh, well, we are. Yeah. Well, what makes you different? History. So it's an affirmation that this Jewish identity makes him different than Norma, that he sees himself as different than these local town people. A difference he'll bring up later in the film also, but it's a difference that the writers and director wanted to make clear right from the start. So as the movie progresses, Ruben tries to get the mill workers to unionize and he's treated as an outsider. Uh, he later sees Norma at a baseball game and we get more symbolism reinforcing that Ruben is, is a high class fish out of water in this backwards town. Uh, when, when he's unable to stomach the hot dog, served at the baseball game. But at the same time, he offers to pay for Norma's food out of charity. Now, Reuben's superiority over Norma is expounded upon when she begins to talk about her baby daddies and the dynamic of master and, and teacher that will go on throughout the rest of the movie really begins. Fast forward a little bit, Norma runs into Reuben once again, this time when she's on a date with a, a local and equally ignorant and simple white guy. Uh, she invites him to sit down with them, and Reuben once again takes on the role of the mentor. Not only is this easily seen through the camera with the way the shots are framed, with Reuben much larger than Norma and her date, uh, like a, a father talking to his kids, but he again rejects the local food and drink because he's dissatisfied with the quality, and then drives the two home because they're too irresponsible and drunk, and again looks down on her as she's vomiting at the side of the road. It's continuing to build this dynamic of superior and inferior. Now, a short time later, Norma gets married rather abruptly with the man that she went on a date with, who is also a single parent. Uh, the wedding is small, and the marriage seems to be kind of lacking in romance, but it's rather a, a result of two impoverished single parents coming to an arrangement of convenience. Norma's new husband is always viewed as kind of a simple, average man, lacking inspiration, and we get the idea she's settling to get out of her parents' house. The story moves on to the first meeting of the mill employees that want to maybe unionize. Uh, the meeting's held in a black church, and nearly all of the attendees, other than Norma, are black. And again, all the black characters are seen as, as good, decent people that want to help out, and all the white people are very suspicious of Reuben, and I never want to hear him out. After the meeting, Reuben goes to the mill to enforce, I guess, a federal reg regulation that allows him to post his union literature. And once again, is met by this caricature of the, of basically a southern plantation owner. Like, that's what these characters are. And he has to threaten to sue unless he's allowed to post his notices because they're giving him such a hard time. And then Norma, inspired by his feistiness and the way he handles these uh, plantation owners decides to finally volunteer and work for the union. The first repercussions that she receives from volunteering for the union, the first enemy, if you will, that she makes is oddly enough from her Christian church. She goes to the church and she makes this speech about how she's been going there since she was six years old and implies to the preacher that if he doesn't support the union and let them meet at his church, 
that he's not really a man of God. And there's something fundamentally wrong with his church. Now, isn't this an important detail, considering the context of this film? Not just the faith of the writers and the director, but just the relationship the left has always had with Christianity. That somehow, by not supporting their agenda, that Christianity is illegitimate. So, in this moment, Norma Ray, the ignorant country Christian bumpkin, who is now formally being mentored by the benevolent leftist Jewish labor organizer from New York, discards her lifelong religion in favor of this new ideology because Christianity was evil. The next enemy she makes is her bigoted racist white neighbors who don't like that she's bringing black people into her home for union meetings. And then her evil white racist husband who is appalled by the idea that she invited black people over to their home. There's a bunch of black men in there. You're going to get us in a whole lot of trouble. I ain't never had any trouble with black men. But Norma Ray, thanks to Reuben, is now totally woke. She's breaking free of the racism that afflicts every other white person in the movie. And together, they begin to overcome the backward ways of the whites. No scene in any well-made movie is unintentional. And it's with this knowledge that I find it peculiar that with the constant putting down of white Christians in this film, and not exactly subtle, idolization of Reuben, that it wasn't enough for the filmmakers to have Norma always inferior to Reuben, for the dynamic of the film to, to be that of a patient teacher mentoring a slow student, but that they decided to take it a step further. In this scene, where Reuben gets his shirt dirty and decides to take his clothes off and go skinny dipping. And you see, it's not enough for Norma to idolize Reuben to hang on his every word, she also has to want him sexually. But Reuben, ever the patient custodian of wisdom and morality, doesn't take advantage of Norma's burning desire for him. So she's left frustrated. Honestly, in, in my view, this film is so much more condescending to whites than the handful of movies that Hollywood would make 10 years later about the white woman who goes to the schools in the ghetto and teaches the black kids how to graduate or dance or whatever those ridiculous movies have them do. Because at least in those movies, there was always that moment where the white lady who came to the inner city would have a learning moment, where the disadvantaged kids would teach her something about their culture or, or maybe about herself. In Norma Ray, that never, ever happens. Reuben is the perfect man the Savior come to rescue the poor, stupid white people from themselves. And this scene really highlights that as clearly as, as anything can. I'm not going to go into detail of the rest of the film because it's really kind of just this continued theme of Norma being woke and fighting for the union and ignoring her husband and her family and fighting the evil white racists and trying to impress Reuben. Towards the end of the film, she's reminded... That just like the food in her town, Norma doesn't measure up to Reuben's standards. Just as her husband, despite providing for the family, even after she gets herself fired, and he takes care of the children while she's out running around being woke, he will never measure up to her standards. He knows this, and he accepts this, but the writers frame it like it's somehow he owes this to her. Because she's a strong, independent woman now. He should be so lucky. And now this independent woman, that after finally helping to unionize the mill, having done everything she could to help Reuben impose his values on this community, this independent woman is left standing in the middle of the road, staring longingly after him as he drives away. And that is the story of Norma Ray. Hollywood's view of white America presented to the world in 1979, a view that won Sally Fields an Oscar for Best Actress for representing white people as ignorant racist hillbillies with the need to be fixed. People who can't determine their own destiny until someone like Reuben comes to town and shows them that they're doing it all wrong. And then, after remaking it in his own image, leaves moves on to the next town, and then the next, and then the next, 
and then the next.